better get me back, as it'll be dark soon, and they mostly come at night. Mostly. Welcome to Mostly Horror. Mostly. I am Steve. And I am Sean. And What's up, guys? Episode... <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, we said we're not going to say episode numbers anymore. We're in the hundreds. We're not. We're below 110 is where we are currently. It's one of this, them. I think this it might be episode, 108. 107, I think, is what it is. No. Catherine. Catherine's Jenna, 10. Kath, Catherine's 106. Yeah, Jenna's 107. Yeah. Steve Beck. Steve episode Beck. 108. Steve Michael Beck. Steve Beck has directed Beck, two films that you may not know that he's the director of. Uh, sometimes there are films. I love. I love talking to Steve. There are films where you know, you know, a new Jordan Peele film is coming out, or you know that there's a lot of films that you're like, I know that movie by name. Those names being Thirteen Ghosts and Ghost Ship, but you may not know who directed yeah, those films. And it just so happens mm-hmm. that the man who directed those films is a insanely talented commercial director visual artist yeah. fucking yeah. theme park designer sculptor yeah. uh writer yeah. you know a million things and he just mm-hmm. happened to direct two i don't even need to say cult classic just two classic yeah. horror films yeah. um we have the pleasure of talking with him today in this episode um he doesn't do a lot of interviews there i could only find one other one online so yeah come here for all of your steve beck news um yeah <laughs> but we got the great. scoop we got we the got back the, scoop dude we got the scoop on beck uh so that's today's yeah. episode before we get into that uh let's let's jump into a bit of you may already know that i'm sure you already knew that you only tell me stuff i already know you already know what i'm going to tell you I'm Fine. hearing the sound bit in my head. Oh, yeah. yeah I was happened. like, what are you, what are you waiting yeah. for? You have the thing that we probably already know. <laughs> oh, you want well, so well, You got to go first. I don't You got to go first. Actually, I'm, before we start okay. off, before we start off, just mm-hmm. knowing that we, you're going to talk about, Chelsea, can you start us off with with just one one of the radioactives uh, from <laughs> the song radio? Just, a, just one radioactive. Sean, pretend like you hear it and then go into telling your bit. Ready? Yeah. Chelsea, go. <laughs> Oh, dude, I'm hyped up for it. All right, listen, guys, it's there's a good chance. I don't know. I don't know how many people know this. I if you're on TikTok, maybe you know there's yeah. there's a viral video that was talking about it that first put me onto it. Um, it is weird, dude. Florida, Florida out here flirting, you know. Um, <laughs> Florida, Florida, <laughs> Florida just pulled the most Florida shit I've ever. And listen, if you're a, a listener from Florida, I'm not trying to diss you, but Seek your help. state is is whack is whack dude it's yeah. it's whack for a lot of reasons uh first yeah. off you guys don't seem to like women very much uh, yeah. you don't seem to like don't seem to like uh you know anyone that isn't just a, a cis straight white dude very much but also yeah. you don't like i don't know your cells very much yeah. uh apparently in florida there is a bill right now that is on the floor and will likely pass there is a bill in florida that is proposing that literally this is not just a a hook thing that they put radioactive waste in your roads like they want to literally take radioactive material and pave your streets with it um the radioactive waste specifically would be coming from the fertilizer industry and i want to stress before before i start quick simplified overview it is not the kind of radioactive where you know these particles are are breaking through everything it's not, you know, it's, not, it's not like a nuclear yeah it's not a, a it's nuclear not, plant it's necessarily it's not isotope but, nine, whatever the fuck. <laughs> it's not uranus either um but <laughs> it is <laughs> it is the kind of uh you know poisonous radioactive material that if you were to if it were to end up in your water supply that would be mm-hmm. awful if it if any particles were to end up in the air during the construction of these roads for example or the breakdown of these roads uh for for any reason that would be awful um it is bill let me find it again it's right here hb one nine one one nine one um and i'm going to read from an article 
uh, from OPB, uh, but there's there's all sorts of sites on this. I'm not going to talk about the credibility of this one necessarily. I've looked at a few different things, but um, Bill HB 1191 would compel the Florida Transportation Department to study using f- phospho phospho gypsum phospho gypsum. Uh, I feel like I'm not saying that right. Sure. Uh, in paving projects, calling for demonstration projects using phosphogyps- phosphogypsum. I know I'm not saying that right. In road construction, uh, and it sounds it sounds silly. Phosphogypsum. Uh, road construction. Yeah. Gypsum's like a rock. Uh, but basically, they they want to they the fertilizer industry has this overwhelming issue that they don't know what to do with their radioactive waste, which I didn't even realize that the fertilizer, that this was a problem in the fertilizer Mm -hmm. world. But yeah, they want to, they basically want to use it in roads uh, as a way of getting rid of it. And, um, and again, it just goes into everything that I was just saying. It it doesn't make any sense. I, I don't understand. And it's not like, it's not like, uh, people that are not approving of this just Mm -hmm. don't understand the science behind it like the scientific community is coming out against this um so yeah i don't know man what are what are your initial thoughts on that steve i think uh, i'm curious uh normally they require like research into this sort of thing which doesn't mean that it's going to be done right or whatever but like normally they'll be like Mm -hmm. yeah you can do this on the stipulation that you like research it before you put it into whatever um who knows if that's going to be done correctly. Um, but yeah, I haven't been to Florida since 2014, maybe. And I have no plans to go back. So I was about to say, I'm I'm going to say a couple things here. Again, this is not to disrespect any of our Florida listeners. Um, Florida, I don't know if it's like just a Michigan. I can't imagine it's just a Michigan thing. It's a hot spot. Like everyone and their fucking mom growing up went to Florida as like a yeah. vacation. Like, yeah. Our, our roommate, Chelsea, her family went to Florida at least once a year. It's just like a regular thing. I've been to Florida several times. I have, I have some family in Florida. Um, I never re- – like there are just – Florida is always kind of humid, uh, and mm-hmm. the ocean's always colder than I want it to be when I get into it, and I've just that's never just been ocean. like crazy, yeah. crazy about it. Yeah. No, that's not true. That's not true. I've been to Hawaii, and I've been to Cali, and it's not. Um, I, it's Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, West Coast. I'm sorry. I'm I'm showing West Coast love right now. I'm I'm sorry, guys. Oh, trust um, me. Yeah, I prefer the but... West Coast over to Florida. <laughs> but but I will say, like, dude, my paranoid self, straight up, will never go to Florida again. If that if that if I found out that that bill passed, I would not go. There's no explaining or justifying or anything that anybody could ever do. It's just it's like sharks with me. I there is not a situation that I would fucking go, unless are you. If you are going to pay off all of my student loans, sure, I'll visit Florida for a day and then I'm I'm out. <laughs> but other than that, but other than that, I'm not what fucking if going to Florida. I would if you pay have your radioactive loans. roads. What if I would pay your student loans, but you had to live in Florida for the rest of my life? Yeah, yeah, for the for the the next twenty years where my body grows Slow tumors tears. and mutations. Yeah, dude, I've seen Chernobyl. I'm not. Yeah. I don't buy it, dude. I'm not doing it. Um, So apparently the bill sets a deadline of April 1st, 2024, giving the transportation agency less than a year to complete its work. So all the different bullshit testing and stuff that they want to do and, you know, to decide if they're going to make the recommendation. But the Republican dominated Florida legislature, well, that word didn't come out right, legislator, uh, approved the measure by a wide margin. So that makes sense. You know, Republicans just you know, chasing dollar signs before using their brains or their hearts to make any decision about anything regarding anybody ever. So Color fuck surprised. Republicans, fuck, fuck the politics and the p- politicians in Florida, fuck the fertilizer industry. And, uh, my hearts truly go out to like, to like anybody that might have to face this as a, as a reality in their homes or, uh, or in their jobs. Uh, I think of the workers that will for sure get fucking cancer. So, yeah. You don't. We don't talk about. That's we talk about, about big that. pharma a lot. We don't talk about big fertilizer enough. Yeah, dude. Fuck big to, fertile, dude. We need to talk to big, <laughs> big fertile. fertile. Big fertile. Dude, big fertile. Big fertile. Can All my be homies it. hate big fertile. Dude, I never had a single homie that fuck with big fertile, and that's yeah. on God. That is on God. 
Jesus Christ. Uh, another thing that you probably already know um, yeah. that we didn't know and we just found out, and it's kind of this is kind of like an addendum to something we were talking about, I believe, in our last episode. Can't keep oh, track yeah. anymore. Um, yeah, dude. I think to end our last episode, we talked about Tubi a little bit. Yeah, I think I brought it up a little I bit. I think I said Shooby Dooby something about Tubi. Uh, we. <laughs> Great, great little <laughs> dance. Shooby dooby. Uh, you guys can't see that little dance Sean's doing. Um, Tubi, I recently found out, thanks to Phil mm-hmm. Nobile for, for sharing the information. Uh, Tubi is owned by Fox, which isn't the best thing. Um, yeah. Which means, you know, all the ad money and that sort of stuff eventually funnels up. Um, right. I don't, you know, I'm sure the people that run Tubi are great people and I don't know anything about that, mm-hmm. but I feel like it's worth knowing. Um, did some research, you know, back in 2020, Tubi was bought by Fox, uh, Fox Corp, Fox Corp um, for about $440 million, which seems crazy, but I guess enough people watch it. Um, yeah. And then... Fox had the option to sell it. They got a two billion dollar offer um, in the beginning of this year, and they turned it down, which is very interesting. Um, hmm. But yeah, it's it's something that I feel like is worth knowing, kind of like ethical consumption. The yeah. you know Absolutely. you want to know before you watch, sort of thing. At least um, make it, yeah, be able to make so a yeah, decision. Be zoned by Fox, and now I, I know that. So I'm a little confused. So I was saying I, I was promoting Tubi last time because it, it has a, su- a surprisingly interesting catalog free. of movies. It was like, yeah, it's free. You know, there there are some commercials in it, but they're I find them to be less annoying than like than like other commercial yeah. situations that I have on streaming services. Um, and yeah, it's it. I was mainly impressed with like the catalog. I was seeing stuff like, oh, shit, I haven't seen this in forever. And mm-hmm. I, you know, um and uh, Jared Krzyzewski, I think, had had tweeted about it, uh, saying that, that people were sleeping on it. Um, I am kind of confused. So, I mean, Fox is owned by Disney, though, right? Am I mixing shit up? Like, that's a, that's a thing. Fox right? is Who, not owned by Disney, I yeah, don't believe. It's not? I could have swore to God. No? I don't, I don't Are they, like, different so. things? How did... Disney bought... What am I mixing up? Disney bought... Mm-hmm. Um, they own Fox's film and TV libraries, so they purchased like 20th Century Fox, which is now just 20th Century okay. Studios, and like Fox yeah. Searchlight, which is now just Searchlight. Um, but is the money is the money all still connected? I don't know enough about like big studio money. I, the way I will, I, I mean, think, I think the Walt mm-hmm. Disney Company. And listen, if you guys are listening and and we're not right, then like tell us. But I, I'm yeah. pretty sure that Disney bought Fox Studios. Like, they bought Fox's studios. So 20th Century mm-hmm. Fox, Searchlight. I don't know if there's any other ones. So it's now just 20th okay. Century and, and, and Searchlight. Sure. I've been a bit confused about how that all works. Because I was like, so is, is Disney just like a big, like, Republican thing? Um, or how... I just... I don't... I want to understand the money. Granted... It's no ethical consumption under capitalism. Any company that you like, unless it's like literally a locally owned independent thing, most of the time, if you trace things up high enough, you will find out that someone that is a really shitty person and yeah. or is involved in shitty things is getting paid. That is just the reality of the world that we live in. And we have to make our own decisions about what we do and do not partake in, yeah. um, both for, for our essential needs and just, you know, you can't deny yourself every fucking piece of happiness because of that reality. Uh, but, you know, it's obviously so, up to everyone to to choose. So just for a little edification, Fox mm-hmm. obviously owned all those things. Disney bought 20th, 21st Century Fox, um, like the studio company, um, okay. which included the 20th Century Fox Film and Television Studios, U.S. cable channels such as FX, Fox News, um, or sorry, Fox Networks, not Fox News. Um, the remaining okay. assets that were not acquired by Disney were spun off to create Fox Corporation, which is what uh, owns Tubi, amongst many other things, including okay. Fox News. So they are um, that purchase separated those things, even though the name is still there. Cor- it's like correct. the money is Disney owns these. It's not like it owns 
and it doesn't to these things. It doesn't call them 20th century. It's not called 20th century Fox anymore. The name Fox sure. has been scrubbed okay. from all those things. Um, all right. Cool. And yeah, I mean, it's still, you know, Fox Corp is owned by Rupert Murdoch. Um, don't need to talk about Rupert Murdoch right now, but yeah, yeah, that's just, uh, that's a little bit of back backstory and, and um, explanation behind who owns what here. <laughs> Because it is kind sure. of confusing. Um, yeah. So, so that's Tubi. I'm glad I was here to ask the big questions. Shooby dooby. <laughs> Should we watch Tubi? To be or not to be? To be? Oh, that's up to you, dude. That's a good one. <laughs> Damn. That's... So, sometimes I wish we had different titles for our things, for our episodes, so we could use things like to be or not to be. That is, yeah. that is a good one. Uh, one thing I know for sure is this episode will be called Stephen yeah, Beck. Yeah. Or Steve Beck, 13 Ghosts, yep. and Ghost Ship. Uh, any final thoughts before we let the listeners hear our interview? He was a really nice guy. He was so fun <laughs> to talk to, man. I, I really did. Like, we just got done with this interview, you know, recording this now. And and I'm just in a good mood. Like, it was such a good conversation. He had so much to say. I, I love these movies, I, especially, you know, 13 Ghosts. Um, he's involved in, in some big stuff out there. He's a very talented guy. And uh, and it was just so interesting to learn about his backgrounds. And I, I think that you guys are going to dig it. Like always, man. We, yeah. We got, shout we out got to the good unsung people. Com- shout out to the unsung commercial directors of the world. Um, yeah, dude. All right. On that note, we will let you guys hop into our interview with Steve Beck, director of 13 Ghosts and Ghost Ship. And as always... Listen at the end for our mostly horror recommendations, as well as a little sneak peek at something Sean and I were involved in recently. All right. Today we are joined by Steve Beck. You know Steve as a commercial and feature filmmaker, as well as a visual artist and sculptor known by horror fans for his classic films, 13 Ghosts and Ghost Ship. Steve, thank you for being on the show today. Well, you're certainly welcome. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Absolutely. Pleasure. So, I, so I have to, to have say, you. I feel honored because in you know we do uh, a good amount of research for all of our guests, and uh, you don't do a lot of interviews. Specifically, I have like one podcast interview I found, and this is an honor to have you on and be able to yeah. uh, you know be one of the few. Well, I think I'm part of that graying herd that's out sort of on the the perimeter that just uh, is watching from the the fence post and just uh, I don't know. There was plenty back in the day, but uh, it, uh, that's it, fair. it tapered off. But yeah, that's fair. Sure. But people seem to yeah people seem to still be watching these darn films, and so I'm I always take pride in the, <laughs> a bit of joy and chuckle with the uh, you know they how are. much they're still entertaining people. So oh, they are definitely still watching the films. I can promise you that. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, we, yeah, we'll schedules. get to it. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, well, that's I'm, true. I'm, that's true. I am very happy about that. Trust me. Trust me. <laughs> right, you got the numbers. <laughs> yeah. So. Before, obviously, we're going to talk about your films and, and your career. Before we jump into that, there's an aspect, uh, something that I found just kind of in a throwaway line doing research that mentioned that you were, at, I guess, at one time, a theme park designer. Is that true? Uh, yeah, actually, that is true. Um, when I joined uh, Lucasfilm back in 1988, um, I took over the art department uh, responsibilities. Um, and at the time, I worked on a couple of films for them. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, I was the visual sets art director on. And I also okay. helped out on uh, The Abyss as well under the same offices. And then what this, at the same time what was happening was that George had done uh, a couple projects with Disney. Uh, he had done uh, an Indiana Jones ride and another one. Oh, he did Star Tours. That's what it was. Mm-hmm. And then another piece that was done for Epcot Center, I believe. And so there was all this sort of interest from Lucasfilm proper, not ILM, mind you, but Lucasfilm proper, about doing more theme park work because George had such a great time with Disney on the project. Again, this was like 19, of 90, 91. So they, mm-hmm. there was a division that was set up. It was called um, LucasArts Attractions. And the seed money for that division came from a project uh, that was going to be a a theme park uh, located on the western shores of Oahu. It was called Koalina was the location. And uh, yeah, and so we spent uh, a bit of time coming up with attractions work for those folks. Um, everything from 
uh, hard rides and what to do with it. We had a, a series of, of roller coasters that actually, the park itself, the intention of the park was more uh, a nature scape of anything, but we were embedding it within, you know, themed attractions. So we had three roller coasters that kind of resembled when they kind of came together, a helium atom. Okay. And we kind of took them back apart and went in the various ways. Uh, we had a restaurant, for example, that was uh, the Titanic as it was sinking. And this was before the film Titanic. Um, <laughs> that was just kind of a lot of interesting stuff that you could play around with because wow. at, the, you know, at the time there wasn't anybody but Disney. And, of course, Universal, of course, was doing their thing, too, with their yeah. um, their properties and their content. But that was it. So you know, it, was, uh, it was an open book to play with. So we had a lot of fun with it for a while. And then we figured out it is... was all real. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was good until we all figured out it was all real estate speculation. Oh. And there was all these real estate companies just trying to get George's signature on things, so they could go out and take out all these corporate loans and run away God. with it. So, yeah. Oh, so again, heartbreaking. It's, it, it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. <laughs> we did some fun stuff. We did some fun stuff. It was really cool. Yeah, there's... it's the um. The uh, the world of like theme park creation is something that I just recently kind of stumbled into in the in the last like year or so. I Disney uh, Disney Plus has a great couple docs on like the Imagineers and building yes, their theme parks. Yes, yes and do. and watching there's a few YouTube channels about just the nerds out there that love amusement parks and breaking down the history and stuff like that. And it's just uh -huh. such a it is an an art form with thousands of people involved. And I encourage all the listeners to look more into that so to hear that you were a part of this and and you know conceptualizing these these amazing things and that it was just kind of passed over or taken advantage of is is That's really uh, it, i think you know we yeah. like to see we were before our time and now we kind of walk away with our heads a little higher than we were before sure. um yeah. yeah no it's it's it is um that industry uh, although again it is you know it's not every day if somebody needs a theme park right and yeah, opposed sure, to a commercial sure. which is kind of why i still with commercials frankly um yeah, uh, Disney has done some amazing, amazing uh, attractions over the years. And for example, if you go to Disneyland right now, there's a uh, a ride called Rise of the Resistance, um, yeah. and it's in the new Star Wars yeah. land, if you will. And mm -hmm. on that attraction, if you just sort of step back and look at all the technology that they applied to that singular attraction, it's phenomenal the study that they did just on transportation and movement and and gathering a story around all of that stuff but i mean they are they are flooding every technology just to make things interesting for people to, to have fun with so it's yeah, uh if anybody's so interested cool. out there i i don't know even know where you study for that stuff i mean there's, <laughs> that's what there's i'm saying <laughs> yeah i don't know yeah it's not like you can it's a you know university of phoenix or a university of youtube but um uh there are schools now i went to art center college of design in pasadena and i know now they have a uh an entertainment entertainment concepts major, which hmm. kind of I think sort of filters towards that. It yeah. also filters towards uh, uh, art direction for film and that kind of business. But they do touch upon you know that application a bit. So if people are interested in that, that you know, and it's they were better times, frankly, because at the moment you know everybody's going through some you know some restructuring sure. at this point in time. But uh, of course, yeah, it's an exciting field. I mean, imaginary. When I got out of school at Art Center, that's what I wanted to do. And I went to Disney, this was in 1981, and they said, sorry, kid, we're shutting down. <sighs> and this was before Eisner arrived uh, and yeah. resurrected the studio, Reinvented. Eisner, Katzenberg, yeah. and you know, Frank Well, That's before they had arrived, and it was still under the tutelage, I think, of Roy Disney. I think that's right. Um, and it was just, they were ready to close. They were ready to close everything. They were, they were ready to shut down. And yeah, I was like, geez. oh, okay. So then you kind of, life takes old and you turn left and then suddenly you find yourself someplace you never expected to be so that's kind of yeah. <laughs> the story of my career frankly it, <laughs> it seems like it i mean as as steve mentioned you know you you've had your hands in so many different parts of the industry and the art world um i also love how you just casually mention i did a couple films with them and you name indiana jones last crusade <laughs> the abyss uh, i know the hunt for red october's there like that's you know some of some incredibly influential films um and and you mentioned that you you really stuck to to commercial work. And if I'm if I'm not mistaken, it was actually a commercial that you did for First Union Bank um, that aired during a Super Bowl that kind of landed you into yeah, that, Thirteen Ghost. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what the 
I, I guess that was the the, the big parade that uh, kind of went down the street that Joel Silver finally saw. Uh, we had done actually three years of campaigns for First Union, and we were on the Super Bowl for three years running with uh, the First mm-hmm. Union group. And they were great projects. And this was all, uh, this was all done for ILMCP, which is ILM Commercial Productions. Um, and it was uh, uh, Hal Wining Associates was the uh, the advertising agency here in San Francisco. And it was just a phenomenal opportunity to really kind of go kind of batshit crazy with the visuals. And Hal was really pushing for us to like not make a bank commercial. Okay. It was like, whatever you do, don't show people in line smiling at the teller. And, you know, we sure. want something. We want something people are going to say, what the hell was that? <laughs> and we had, and that was it. That was the challenge. And um, he just let us rip. And we just had so much fun for those three years working on those projects. Just had a, had a great time. And yes, you know, that got out there to the Super Bowl crowd. And yes, it was seen by Joel Silver. And eventually he just kind of said, he didn't ask me. He told me I was starting on Monday. <laughs> and I was like, what? Who's this? And I went down and, you know, when the biggest shark in the deepest end of the pool asks you to work for him, you do it. You yeah. just yeah. kind of, that's just one of those things that you just do. And um, I worked with a great producer, Gil Adler, who was also one of the triumvirate in uh, Dark Castle. It was, it was Gil and uh, Bob Sinek and Joel Silver. They were the kind of the three people that ran Dark Castle. And uh, Gil was the sort of on-set producer, the on, the line producer, if you will, the guy who kind of was running the show at the shows and who was great to work with. And um, the best part about it, I think, was that Joel was just so goddamn busy with The Matrix, he left us alone. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm just going to keep going until somebody says no. Yeah. And we just kept going. At, and we had so much fun with it. And I have to give uh, Joel the immense credit of He's the one who came up with the glass house. He he didn't want some gothic thing. He wanted a glass house you could see through, uh, and that's entirely was his invention. And it's it was probably the the biggest part of that movie was yeah, that damn house. Oh, yeah. And you had like you you walked into at least like some semblance of of a script and and things of that nature, right? Like this, you you at least had pieces to work with before you started directing it is that true like the script was already uh, oh no we had a script we, we, no yeah. no we had a script there there was a script and then there was several more as there tend to be right yeah um yeah. the first yeah. script um the the writer uh was extremely articulate about who has to stand where in what place at what particular time to keep yeah. the clock moving in the right way and we just like that's just just a, a nature that's not going to work as a storyline and so that went on but his structure is kind of what we stuck with and gotcha. of course, it's all based on William Castle's piece, right? Yeah, of course. And there is obviously with William Castle's piece, there is a bit of tug and cheek. And they had fun too, obviously, when mm-hmm. they made their film. Uh, and then Terry Castle, uh, his daughter, was kind of uh, she was one of the co-producers, and she was with us all the time. So she was always talking about her dad's work and stuff like that. Um, so we did have a script, uh, and it got rewritten, rewritten once by a guy by the name of Rich DeVito. I believe that was who did it, Rich DeVito, and. Um, you know, then it just kind of went into motion and you just kind of just started cooking. And it was, yeah, full of, full of holes, of course, as <laughs> most are. Um, and we had obviously wonderful assistance from the cast on how to fill some of the gaps. Yeah. And there was a bit of improvising that happened with the, with the production and everybody chipped in. And I think that's what makes it such a great film is because it feels kind of influenced by the people that actually had to say the words as opposed to just saying the words and you having to sort of swallow them yeah um you know from tony schlimm to, to everybody to matt everybody everybody did a, a great job uh, f murray particularly f murray raw digger i mean jesus christ yeah. first you film, know right <laughs> yeah first film running out of the box and she's the star you know yeah it's just amazing once you kind of convince your actors to own it and where they see gaps how they can fill them very easily or fill them more in more importantly very naturally with yeah. things that really propel the story, really take the narrative and push it in places you didn't expect to go. So that's, so, uh, that's what I, happened. I'm sure. I mean, it really sounds like, or, or at least looking at, you know, the, the context of the cast. I mean, Tony Shalhoub, not really a huge film actor, at least at that point, he's obviously been in movies, you know, now, but still, still mainly a TV actor. You have 
you know, mm-hmm. Matthew Lillard coming off Scream. You have, you know, Rod Digga, first film. Um, uh, what, uh, are there any, like, particular memories that, that come to mind from that cast? Or, or was there anything kind of unique about their different backgrounds coming together at this time? Um, I think the, the most enduring thing about that cast is that everybody gets, everybody chipped in. And nobody yeah. kind of, uh, nobody wore the diva label. There wasn't one on the set. Uh, F. Murray, who had obviously outscored yeah. us all, um, was just the the kindest, gentlest person you ever want to work with. And even afterwards, when we were doing a lot of post production work, he was so much fun just to be around and to deal with. And you know, mm-hmm. he had a, you know, he knew what he was playing. He wasn't, yeah. he wasn't swinging for the Oscar fences, obviously, but he knew what the character was and how to have fun with it and how to deal with it. And how to make people in the audience believe it, you know, it had to go somewhere. And then the yeah. wonderful part about Tony's just vulnerability is really what sold the whole thing. Yeah, you know, he he, he was he was just being a, he was a vulnerable father in a shitty situation. And oh my god, what am I going to do now? And everything yeah. else, no matter if it was ghosts or anything else under the sun, it didn't matter. It was just all about gathering, regathering his family. That's all. That's that was the singular mindset. And he would go out in the evenings. We were filming up in Vancouver. He would go out in the evenings for dinner. I would go out in the evening, and we'd just pass each other the street, and we'd just stop and talk just about whatever happened during the day. <laughs> and he, he was just the most normal, down-to-earth kind of person that you'd ever want to work with. Just a true talent. And here's the interesting thing about Tony. By the time I got the opportunity to work with Tony, you know, he was already a working actor. Yeah. I mean, once he started acting, he never stopped and still hasn't stopped. He's just yeah. one of those guys that will always be acting and has always enjoyed the medium. And you have to look at those kind of people like, wow, that's fantastic. I had no idea you had done so much work. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it is great. Like you have those established actors, the ones that, you know, just started and then the ones that are like at the beginning of their career, like Matthew Lillard is, yeah. saw, I mean, the, the trailer for Friday night or five nights at freddy's whatever that movie is called like matthew lillard's kind of making a resurgence in the horror genre as well oh, yeah. like he's always been a fan favorite is he yeah. is he as like just kind of intense like in a in the best way possible he always just seems like he's throwing everything into his role uh well, he did that time i mean that's i know that for sure you know i actually <laughs> right, still i still time. get christmas cards from matthew lillard and i'm very proud really? of him. wow <laughs> i still get christmas cards for that gentleman and I wish him the best. Wow! I understand he's. Do- I actually oh. understand he's doing a bit of directing now, which is really great. Yeah, I really. I think he's, I didn't, I th- I think yeah. he's dabbled a bit. I mean, he's he kind of like hasn't that. been in a lot of mm-hmm. things recently, but obviously he's, you know, he hits the convention circuit, and he's someone that horror fans are are you know oh, yeah. enamored with. Oh yeah, and so oh yeah, to see him oh, yeah. come back now is great and and him and and your film is just like the epitome of, of matthew Lillard well to me. you know obviously yeah. the, the the fantasy for me was always why hasn't somebody written a script about bobby now 20 years later he's grown up and he still sees matthew lillard because he still has the glasses and together they go TM, and that's trademarked <laughs> yeah have, that's so, uh, yeah we need to copywritten we've, we've you know? recorded this so this is like <laughs> intellectual yeah, well, property yeah. for you now <laughs> yeah no one's allowed to steal that Unfor- from steve <laughs> unfortunately though i don't own any of it so that's uh, gotta go through some other channel but uh, yeah i'm so sure uh, why there's you know this and just you know it could turn into a- an episodic really easily oh it's well <laughs> just so saying it- i don't have to do it i'm just saying it could be done really easily because you all have all the pieces no it's so funny it's so funny that you bring that up i um i have a a TikTok that I made about your about your uh, movie about Thirteen Ghost, and it kind of blew up online and and took off. And uh, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of comments on it. And one of the comments that I see more than anything else is people asking. They said that they love the the bonus featurette about the ghost breaking down the, the history of all of them, and mm-hmm. it's people begging for a show that explores. Right. Um, all the backstories of all the ghosts and and just explores that world. So the fact that you brought that up is fantastic. Yeah. Well, the irony of irony is yeah. remember <laughs> at the end of the film they all get out again, so they're back out there. Exactly. Go yeah, that's what I'm saying. Again. So you know, I think yeah. you are. You're yes. beyond onto something. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I you think mentioned... it's for younger people. Yeah, it'll 
It'll happen. Uh, I you mentioned something about uh, William Castle's original film, which is The Glasses, which obviously you uh-huh. kind of it was readapted into into the um, remake in a different way. Did you ever get to experience his? Uh, it was called like Illusiono, or like his actual gimmick for his original film. It, it, that was just red blue lenses. That's all. That's it was. all. It was just like, yeah, yeah. And they were just. They I just, just know, I didn't 3D, know if you watched his 3D. film. Okay. No, well, I actually purposely didn't watch it because okay, I didn't okay. want to sort of swallow the pill too deeply. I have this. I sure. have this hidden and fear, if you will, about uh, what the subconscious absorbs, and then you in turn turn it into your own invention. But it comes mm-hmm. from a place that you just can't remember where you saw it, but suddenly now it's yours. So I, I tend to stay away from things that I'm actually interested in just to let me sort of blossom my own interest in my own way. But anyway, at the end of the process, um, a woman named Anne Plodsny, and Anne was the visual effects producer, um, she gave me the illusion of glasses in a, in a frame as a, you know, as a gift. And they were just nice. red blue lenses. Um, and I guess during the film, at certain points in time, the 3D kicks in. Yeah. As okay. it was. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what it was at the end of the day. Now, when we did our film, uh, there was a lot of talk about doing something as part of the experience. And we looked mm-hmm. around. Now, again, keep in mind, this was back in, what, 1999, 2000. Yeah. It was right there. Sure. There wasn't a lot of 3D out there in, in theaters. And so yeah. finding enough film theaters that actually had the equipment to do the projection uh, was probably our biggest limitation to this wasn't a lot of them. Yeah. And this was a, a Dark Castle picture, which is designed a very specific way to make a lot of money and was a little bit of seed. Uh, so we weren't going to go out there and revamp all these theater chains. It just wasn't going to happen. And of course. Uh, it was unfortunate, but that's just kind of the way it was for that. Yeah. Yeah. It, I think it, you know, as fun as that would be, I'm, I know that when they make 3D movies, a lot of times they they choose different uh, shots and and compositions than they might have chose otherwise. And so I think that the film does perfectly fine without, without it. it. Um, right. Yeah. It's you know the references are still there. Uh, obviously, yeah. you know we we have plenty of things that we want to talk to you about. I don't want to uh, elaborate too much on Thirteen Ghosts, even though we could do a, a whole episode and probably a part two on this movie alone. Um, <laughs> um, I do want to bring up, you, you talked a little bit, uh, you've mentioned the visual style, and I think that's, you know, the film is is heralded for its its visual style. The Glass House being one of the coolest sets that I've ever seen in a movie. Uh, I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit about building the the atmosphere, um, you know, from, from that set design, uh, mixing this this witchy spell look with this very like technological modern uh you know set design (laughs) and and also yeah i couldn't think of the word there that i wanted to use but then uh you know also the the ghost designs like how what was the process like building up the visual look of this movie um luckily i mean you you remarked about this earlier you know you touched upon the first union campaign the uh, Mm -hmm. The production design was the same person, a guy by the name of Sean Hargrave, very, very, very talented man um, who has an immense imagination. As well, he thought everything through. So he thought not only how the house needed to function and how it needed to shift and close and very, you know, very engineered in a very engineered fashion, but at the same time, he also knew how old it needed to feel so you had all the exposed mechanics everywhere and stuff like that. He he thought it all through. I mean, from soup to nuts. Now, on top of that, and this is the more interesting part about it, this was a very unique set in that every sheet of glass that we used had to be half-inch safety glass. And if you have ever picked a four-by-eight sheet of safety glass up, you're going to need about four or five guys. It's yeah. heavy. It just yeah. one sheet. Now we had to do the entire house, so essentially <laughs> we had to build a steel superstructure, as opposed to just plywood and two by fours. We had to build a steel superstructure to house all that glass. It was literally we built a skyscraper two stories tall inside the sound station in Vancouver, and it's the only way we could do it in order to to hold the weight 
of the glass house. Wow. It just couldn't. <laughs> we couldn't do it any other way. It had to be. What it even? had to be steel. I think we. I think it was like four or six or eight inch box steel structure, steel columns running everywhere, and it was literally like we built this. You could have took this thing out and bolted it to a foundation. You would have had a house. Wow. It was incredible. <laughs> and, and Sean had to go through all that engineering and all that safety precautions with all of that glass to make sure it was all, you know, all, all working and, and make sure it was functional. Yeah. And then the other issue that we had to have beyond this doesn't even get to the production design itself was the literal fear of all those reflective surfaces. We, we bet our lives that we were going to see each other every day in the reflection of the glass. And it only happened once. Yeah, I was about to say that. Shoot, only <laughs> happened once. And that, we, it was like, how did that happen? But it was just yeah, uh, the, the, enough of the shift of an angle. And everybody was required to wear black, of course. But it was yeah. just a miracle that that happened that way. So, again, a lot of that, I just had to give credit to Sean Hargraves for his, his brilliant production design and thinking this shit through. And it, it worked. And uh, we yeah. also oh. had the, the mid break of the whole thing was we shot the first half of the film, the first half of the schedule. And at the very end of that first half of the schedule, that's when we blew up the house. And then we yeah. went out, then okay. we sold all the junkyard stuff for two weeks, two weeks of nights. And during that two week portion, they rebuilt the house back up with glass again. And then we picked up where the story left off. But that's the only <laughs> way we could do it. Because they, they had to rebuild the house um, to make it the basement. Oh. Yeah, okay. okay. So the okay. first half of the schedule was from the ground floor up, gotcha. and the second half of the schedule was from the basement down. So they just had oh, to reset God, everything. Re but we still had to have all the glass and everything, but of course there was no more furniture and all that other stuff was gone. It was all the ghost chambers at the end of the day. So it's, there was that. It, yeah. It's so convenient so, that you could just blow it up. You're like, well, I'm done with the top uh, floor. Yeah. So now we're just yeah, going to yeah. do the explosion yeah. part. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's um, it was a fun thing. It was a cathartic. Oh my god! Oh, I bet it's. Uh, I do want to say I've watched this movie. It, this is, I, I love this movie. I have seen it since I was a little kid. I've seen this movie hundreds of times for sure. And it was <laughs> prepping for this interview was the first time I ever noticed the reflection. Like I've watched that movie so many times and I missed it every time. And somehow the other I night think it was it a hall it. shot. Was it in a hall? I think it was a hall it's, shot. Um, it's Tony is on the ground and uh -huh. uh, I don't even remember who's like talking with him, but it's like an intense scene and it, it, it is in the hall. And so the glass is kind of kind of there. But, yep, you just see I couldn't tell if it was you or a cameraman, but you just see like <laughs> half of it's so good. It's and it's yeah, charming, it. you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, we could figure out. And it was like 50 guys all on that hall at the same yeah. time, you know, cameraman and focus yeah. pullers and, and key grips and everybody else are wedged in there to make sure it worked. Yeah, and then the other part about the the, the, like the glass house, and this was more, I think, script-driven than anything. You know, you start Monday at one portion of the house, and then you work your way around the house, and by Friday, you're back where you started. Because sure, it's a glass house. Yeah. You just saw, I was just here. Why haven't we gone someplace else? Well, the glass house. It's, so that was, yeah. there was that. But uh, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you I, don't ever want a four by eight sheet of glass falling on you. It's <laughs> no, of course weird. not. Of course not. Nope. Um, I do have to ask a little bit about the um, about the ghost specifically. The even the drawings, the black zodiac drawings of all their characters, Isn't... and then obviously their costume design. Um, what what all went into that? It, it just seems so fun. It, it's it's so impressive that you were able to, you know, it feels like a small cast movie, but you technically have like these thirteen, well, these twelve iconic characters how what was the process like building them up uh we actually had uh the screenwriter we sat down with the original screenwriter and kind of talked about each ghost took a bit of articulate notation and then i went to a sketch artist that i knew from my uh, from the ilm art department and hired him on the side did the side hustle with him and he sketched up his interpretation of every ghost that he read about and that became kind of the basis for the arcanum, if you will, all those sketches and that stuff. And that kind of live kind of projected out from there. I could have done it because I wasn't, uh, talented in the way he was with that, with the horror genre, but he took to it like a, you know, Dr. Water. Oh, they're amazing. It's, yeah, I'm yeah. wondering where those sketches ended up. If the studio has them locked away somewhere. Or... I'm sure Joel has them, <laughs> you know, tucked away somewhere. Okay. But, uh, yes. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yes. But I kind of, 
I was looking for him the other day, as a matter of fact. Frank, Frank Thomas? No, not Frank Thomas. Anyways, um, the guy was just an amazing artist, and it kind of came real naturally. I... That's... I want to we I want we got to talk about Ghost Ship in a second, but I am really curious. Like one of the most um, well known international horror films of like from from you know the beginning of horror to now um, is a film called House, which like for people that don't know it, I believe it's a Japanese horror film. It's very colorful and eccentric, but it was done by someone who was a uh, I believe a commercial director in Japan and then directed this horror film and it's it's pretty crazy and visual um you obviously have this commercial background and then you go into making these horror films that are wonderful and and very visual and and known for their visual um appeal i'm curious what you think the background of commercial directing and even your production designer and your you know the, the person that drew the ghosts like they all came from the commercial background as well like what elements do you think they have that added to the, the feature filmmaking process? Well, it, it's, it's an interesting question in that I can only say it was the times. And mm-hmm. again, at the time that I made uh, 13 Ghosts and subsequently Ghost Ship, um, what was going on in Hollywood was there were several production houses out there, Propaganda, for example, and et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. that were spitting out some amazing commercial directors. Um, you know, we all know David Fincher, of course, yeah. who probably led the way, if you will. Um, so the experiment was to take, you know, a commercial director, surround him with Hollywood people so that the Hollywood people felt safe and that the producers of the films felt safe. And then as long as he was surrounded by their people, let him do his thing. Again, okay. the, the issue is always going to be, you know, uh, could he do the same magic for two hours that he did for 30 seconds? Um, sure. But again, the the caveat was, well, we've got enough of our people surrounding this person. Hopefully, that's going to be the case. Now, that's where they were getting their new talent from, but Hollywood at the time. Now, it, that has obviously changed quite a bit. I had my time. Um, other people had their time. Um, but uh, you know, that's where the farm teams all were were in these various production houses, commercial production houses. So, Interesting. You know, again, yeah, it's, that was kind of uh, that was where the where you learned. We played JV. Yeah. I was about to say, and it seems like, you know, you were thrown into the theme park world. You, you know, were taken from the commercial world to this. Uh, the next year after 13 Ghost, you picked up, you know, Ghost Ship, which has, you know, uh, half the budget, but it's it's larger scale, I think, if, if I know uh, the uh-huh. details there. It, was that intimidating? What, like, the whole process, just switching around from from kind of art world to art world, was that what was the pressure like of that sort of situation? Um, it was, it's, 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 it's a, it's a valid question. Um, oh, you know, I think the bigger pressure was 13 ghosts. I, I truly do. Uh, just because you don't know if you can do it, you know, you're, you're not sure, sure if you can make it through. And what happens when you go through these processes is that the literal project itself, it takes over your life. It takes over your subconscious. It takes over every fabric of your being. You you can't walk away on a Sunday and just have a nice day in the park. You're still thinking about Monday. And then when you get done sure. with Monday evening, then you try and sleep. You might sleep, but you're going to dream all about Tuesday before you wake up. And it just kind of yeah. keeps going. It's just a never-ending battle until it's done. And it eats up yeah. about, you know, two years of your life, a, a film does. So sure. I rolled out of 13 Ghosts, and it made a significant impact with the people. Uh, at Warner's and with Joel, they were like, "Great, the scandal's what he's doing. Let's get him in this, mm-hmm. give him the next one," because that's what Joel was doing. He was just like, mm-hmm. "As long as you didn't screw up, keep going. You know, as long as you're making me money and and not being a headache, keep going because I've got enough of that." So <laughs> I went to bat the next year, literally on um, because the uh, uh, the idea for Dark Castle was it always released a horror film on Halloween. They wanted to own Halloween. And okay. so I did 13 Ghosts. It released for the Halloween crowd. And then I did Ghost Ship the next year, and it released for the Halloween crowd again. And then what happened is that uh, the next film, I think, was Gothica. And that's the one where Halle Berry broke her leg in the middle of production, and then they yeah. had to stop production for six to eight weeks. So they missed their Halloween. Oh, and that broke the cycle. But up to that point, 
Dark Castle was all about, they wanted to own Halloween every year. So the Dark Castle film was going to be the big thing. And huh. until it Gothic is, happened, that's what was that little, that little play. It is so funny that you said that because I was thinking of, there's like, you know, horror has its trends and its eras. Um, and I, in thinking of your, in thinking of 13 Ghost, I obviously thought of Ghost Ship. In fact, the, the TikTok video that I talked about earlier, people were saying, you know, it's actually a great double feature. Uh 13 ghost and ghost ship and i don't know that like in that moment they were connecting you know you the uh, as the uh, director and um but it's funny in thinking of like the mood and the way those movies feel gothica came to my head the other day while prepping this and i was like i don't uh -huh. know why that movie feels like that but it it kind of all... just feels like it could coexist i had to yeah. throw that out yeah. there <laughs> same, same yeah production. Uh, so yeah funny. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it was a mindset. Again, what the, the, the overall structure for Dark Castle films was, get a bunch of people, put them in a box, create conflict, throw a lot of horror in it, but don't ever let them out of the box. Yeah. And then end the movie. And as long yeah. as the box is interesting and you're not going to a lot of other places and the box stays where it is, you can do these things uh, very economically and you yeah. can have a lot of fun and a lot of, and a lot of style to them. But keep yeah. the box intact. And keep the you know you know you had X amount of time to shoot them, don't fuck that up. Just tell a good story, do what you got to, do, but keep them in the box. So yeah, you know, as long as and that's you know that's some. If that's all the requirement was, boy, you could go anywhere with that sort of. Yeah, plot. it's a good concept. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and only I mean, yeah, blow yeah, up the box yeah. if you have to. Yeah, yeah, no, blow I mean, up the box yeah. and sink it. Well, we sunk it on the second mode, so you yeah. Know, that, I was going to say, so it's, your your second box is a ship. Which is a slightly yeah. bigger box than the first box. It was a big, I, right. and and <laughs> you know, uh, Ghost Ship is is a great film and has many great parts. But you have one of the most iconic opening scenes, yeah, dare I say, in cinema, but in in at least the <laughs> yeah. horror genre. Uh, <laughs> yes. Can yeah, you I'll, I'll, like? Yeah. That's the best part of the movie. Yeah. It's the I opening. mean, I, it's listen. I, I I love I love the film. I wouldn't say it's the. I don't know if I'm going to say it's the best part, but it's definitely one of the most iconic, like mic drop openers uh, of a horror film. Yes. Um, is that something that you you read it and you're like, oh shit, we're going to start off like you know pretty hot and heavy with this, or like what what's kind of the process going into uh, directing that that iconic scene? Well, uh, you, you you mean you read the words and you go like. What? We're gonna <laughs> cut everybody in half on the first reel, and that's how we're gonna start. Well, okay. Hell Thanks for yeah. a great opening, and then I hope the rest of the yeah. film holds up because that's you know, I'm not sure where we're going from there for Christ's sake. But uh, yeah, but again, the thing that really kind of made that opening work so well was the music. It was yes. the music. Yes. That's that yeah. theme song came in, and that that's. That set the tone, and all of a sudden, here we go, off on the races, you know. So yeah, yeah it you was also like, have... it was it was it was different. Yeah, it was completely different than Ghost than uh, Thirteen Ghost. Yeah, I mean, you also have like the the uh, the browned title cards, like the older title cards, and then you have you know the the credit, the opening credits are like this light blue and pink that are very Who's different this? from like the, oh, yeah. the, the oh, poster yeah. of the film. So you're like, what am I getting oh, into? Yeah. I think I even, oh, I watched yeah. it for the first time recently. I, I've seen 13 Ghosts many times. I've watched Ghost Ship recently and I looked at Sean and I was like, this is how this movie starts. Like with these credits, <laughs> it took me completely and, off guard. Right. This. And I've, I've known for years, it's, I, I know you're not a huge um, horror fan, but as a horror fan, one of them, the, the, some of the most fun that you can have is showing people, these movies that you love that have these crazy things in them. And ghost ship is just one of the most fun movies to show someone because it's, nice. it's so fast and it, the tone is so lighthearted that they're confused and they they ask something like, is this how this starts? And, <laughs> and you just have to sit there quietly smiling. Oh, like, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, just wait. Oh, we're going to have some fun. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Give it about three yeah. minutes. But again, and, again, uh, I had, I had no training in that. I, you know, I know how to shoot a, you know, a can of soup, you know, I did, uh, you know, <laughs> sure. the Nikes. Well, I, we didn't cut anybody in half and we were doing dog food, you know, it was uh, yeah. just, so you, you <laughs> I, have to trust other people that this is yeah. what they want to see. So that's kind of where it went. Yes. It's well, but you, you nailed it. You nailed it <laughs> twice, you know, back to back. It's, um, I, I want to talk, you know, I want to bring up it to, 
going back to 13 ghosts just for a second you you cut a person in half in that movie too when the door closes on the lawyer and it's another one of the most iconic deaths of all time um with one of the best i just have to uh, yeah yeah what does he say he, no, um, no. Rod Digger says, says "Where'd the labor? Where's where the lawyer go? Oh, he, did he split? He split? Yes, yes. yeah. That's what. Yes. It is. No, she, <laughs> that's just, what she it just is. came the, up the with pun. that work. Man, she just came up and walking out the sink. Just meet you. What? Oh what? my god! I hope that was <laughs> the editor probably out. had to. <laughs> right. No, the the editor probably had to fight the urge to go, but on after yeah, it, you know. Exactly. Um, <laughs> well, that's kind of um, like you know. That's how I always viewed horror. It should have that sort of lightheartedness. But I am not a mm-hmm. horror fan, so I yeah. don't mm-hmm. know. But that's well, just of the nature stories. As a a horror fan, I would say yes. It it depends on the movie. I I like movies that are truly just heartbreaking and messed up all the way through, and they don't give you a moment to breathe or or smile. But I also love ones that you know that are all fun. Or I I think that you, your movies are in this perfect. They're so unique. They they kind of stand apart from anything else, and and they're they're this perfect combination of both. Um, uh-huh. uh, you know those those with how lighthearted they are and how kind of uh like weird especially like the house in 13 ghosts it puts you in this world that you're completely unfamiliar with and and there's parts of it that are so funny but then you have deaths like that that are really visceral and uh almost like shock you so it's you have this really good up and down that you do tonally um i do want to ask with those deaths um i guess i'll pose this question to 13 ghost and ghost ship but um how you know you 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 guys put all this effort into your sets. You clearly are using a lot of practical sets, makeup, things like that. You didn't just lean into CGI, but there is a lot of CGI in these films with like the, the splitting in half scene. How, how did you guys go about that on, on, um, on ghost ship, I guess, to start, like how much of that is practical and, and CGI oh, and how, oh, how did you create the effect? Well, uh, let's see. Um, it was all, um, in camera effects, we didn't have money for CG. Okay. Um, so we, you know, we made a lot of false torsos and you know slid them apart just enough to kind of sell the gag. Cut to yeah. you know, it, it was a lot of that. It was a lot of your imagination fills in a lot more than actually was on film. Um, again, wow. because we didn't, our budgets were limited. We we didn't yeah. have a lot of money to go to town with CG. To fact, nope, you said, oh, there is no CG here. Uh, so a lot of it was practical. We worked with uh, some great guys from K and B effects, um, and they brought all of their knowledge and how to do this. And yeah, you know, it's not like I know how to cut a body in half, but uh, they seem to have a very <laughs> page, yeah, they are. He just obeyed. How would you like your beat, sir? Um, <laughs> right. So it was a, it was a you know, it, you just kind of you, you figure it out shot by shot, and you figure it out so you are selling enough of it so the overall illusion is intact yeah and there might have been you know a couple of shots where we had to use you know somebody who saw a hole in the floor you stick his torso through the floor then you put the red of the butt rest of it on top and you pop a lot of blood out of it xyz a lot of stuff like that and then you also use a lot of you know folks that um you know are um disabled and we used you know the amputees in some cases that's used mm. fairly frequently, and you go to town with that one. There's a, there's even one of our thirteen ghosts I think didn't have a head and didn't have any legs or anything, just walked on his hand, and yeah, that was all just, you know, that was a guy. We saw the guy. It was like okay, that I, I'm I'm yeah. good with it, you know. So well, yeah, that's, yeah. So that, I mean, that's, that's what we found. That's one thing that's crazy that I know Sean mentioned with Ghost Ship is like, I mean, based on what I've seen online, like it has half the budget of thirteen ghosts, but it seems you know grander and you i mean you do so much um you do so much in it that it's at least on the same level as 13 ghosts if not more in terms of it seems like the the practical work that went into it so to know that it's mostly practical is is wild yeah um, yeah I well, then that's at the, and at the same tough. time you know what also saved our bacon was you know yeah, the australian dollar was half of what an american dollar was mm, that's true so that's oh. why we filmed down in down in the, on the gold coast down in australia yeah, yeah. we got two for one that's how our sets yeah, became so large and you know we had i think we had 25 cents on that film because yeah. it was half the budget it's and it i him. love that you know <clears throat> a lot of movies just will will throw and there's there's value to this but we'll just throw people in front of a green screen for for most of the movie 
and it doesn't look as good like there there's all this money that goes into to cgi yeah. but i mean i think of the the ballroom scene in ghost ship where you know he's he's in the the old version of of the room that he's in and it slowly transitions into you know it's kind of like a the shining moment almost it feels right. like and it slowly right, transitions right, right, right. with all those ghosts and it's just beautiful it's it it still holds up today so, well I've, I've always yeah. been under the impression that um if you want to get an actor to really be able to dig into something he needs to be influenced by something now a green screen influence you of nothing so yeah. at the end of the day you, as an actor you are struggling to find something amongst all that stuff yeah i think yeah. the the stuff that they're doing now for example with the what they call stagecraft where it's the the led domes and you yeah. go in there laziest fucking filmmaking that i can imagine <laughs> everybody just everybody they're directing from the craft service table for christ's sake that's what they're yeah. doing and it's just like there is no work being put into this and so wow. you know you got just somebody walking around and blah, 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 and it's just all rear projection is what it is in every direction yeah um yeah you take an actor, you embed him someplace where he's not been, and you surprise him with what's going to happen there, you're going to get a completely different performance out of that person. Just because that's human nature, yeah, and that's what course. we do, you take somebody, you 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 know, you, you pull the blindfold off them, and they're suddenly in, a, in a, a foreign environment, they're under assault, and everybody's watching, they're going to act completely different as opposed to being stuck in front of a green screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just Steve get, Beck, you just just get better performances. It's it's just the nature of it. Yeah, of course. Steve Beck with the hot takes. We're right there with you. <laughs> but I, and yeah, also ab- it's absolutely it's taking, with you. Absolutely yeah, with you. It's a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And it's I another whole other thing that we won't dive into. But it, I they yeah. take advantage of a lot of these visual effects teams. You know, these computer CGI guys. They're they're doing all this work and and not getting the money and and it's it's a whole thing uh we do want to jump into you know you've made you made these two movies you you've touched on all these things and lately you've been focusing on a lot of sculpture stuff we peeked at your work and it is awesome i'm so curious how that transition happened and and how you kind of got to the the fine art world side of stuff um so after i made the two films i spent about 10 years on the hollywood development wheel and okay. after 10 years, uh, I was attached to five other different films, and none of them went. And again, okay. as you spend two years trying to get something someplace, after sure. a certain point in time, you just have to ask yourself, you know, is is, is it really worth it? And I mm-hmm. told myself at a certain point in time, as an artist, I want to be my last client. Um, and so uh, when I was done, sure. after that 10-year period, um, I was also sort of wrapping up on my commercial career too, as well. Uh, that does also have a shelf life and you do age out, uh, of those careers. Um, like it or not, you just, the old guy in the room doesn't always work anymore in a very useful culture, if you will. And mm-hmm, rightly sure. so. And, and you, everyone wants fresh blood. Everybody wants to take ownership of the new thing. There's talent coming through the door all the time. And to take advantage of that, you have to just kind of go through these processes. Well, when you get to the point where you're kind of spotting the writing on the wall, um, I decided to go back and try sculpture. Now, I had met an amazing sculptor at ILM, uh, Richard Miller, who uh, recently passed away, an amazing artisan, worked on so many different films uh, at ILM. He was just the kindest, most gentlest, most talented guy I've ever met. And Richard um, kind of took me under his wing uh, when I was at ILM and just taught me a bit about sculpting. And so when I came back to this point in my life where I said, okay, I want to do something finally just for me, just for my own identification, just to explore my own artistic side. And so the sculpture work kind of came into play and I was pursued it for about five years. I did two different versions. I did a finite sort of um, approach. And that's, I think what you see online that I also did a very commercial art approach, which was a lot of surf sculpture. And mm-hmm. it was just a variation on the theme, if you will. Um, and then after that, I finally discovered what they meant by starving artist. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I know that life. <laughs> I so, know that life. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's, it's wonderful while you're in the middle of it and, and, and playing with all this clay and, and doing all this stuff. Um, it's, just, it's just a lot of work to be an artist. It's hard yeah. sometimes, you know. And as artists, you know, 
you're always putting yourself out there. You're, you're exposing parts of yourself that are quite vulnerable. And sure. when it's not the hot thing, you kind of wonder, what the heck am I doing this for, X, Y, Z. So it was a point yes. in my life where I really wanted to just sort of say, indulge yourself. And my wife was very much, indulge yourself. You've earned the right after 35 years to do something for yourself. Yeah. So that's what kind of brought me into the, the sculpture world. And I did that yeah. for about another five, seven years. I still have, uh, the, the work still shows in galleries. Um, and I'm so infatuated with the medium. Uh, it just, you know, I don't know. It just was yeah. something I had to do for myself when I moved on. Yeah, yeah sure. I love yeah. them. I, yeah, it's, they're so I, interesting. I'm, figure, figure is great. And it's, it looks like you're working in bronze. Um, yeah, bronze and, and sound object. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to say bronze, and I, I wasn't going to use the term found object, but that's exactly what I was trying to, in our notes, trying to find earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this this reoccurring theme with the cans, and and you do this this other yeah. stuff, and and there's uh, you know an element an element of story to it. Um, yeah, well, again, at I, the time, I, I was really I was just enjoyed. interested in sort of you know deconstructing the the human condition, human relationships, how we kind of put ourselves out there. What does it mean? How do you challenge assumptions? Was essentially the theme of that campaign, if you will, or that that line of. Uh, pieces and uh, everybody seemed to enjoy it i've i sold them all uh so i guess we enjoyed something <laughs> i was gonna but say whether yeah, i wanted to pursue that for my life I don't know. if they're if they're in any galleries in new york i would love to know so we can uh check them out in person I, because i love new, new, all, all the west coast they're all the west coast i can't drive that far I guess that's that's fair. <laughs> no, yeah. Same. no. Um, but I, so what i've done since then is i've gone back into you know i went back and uh got quite serious about writing so i've got a manuscript that i'm trying to shop around now um uh, based on it's a ya uh, uh dystopian fantasy um dealing with climate change uh, trying to get it off the ground and then recognizing right away the hypocrisy of trying to publish a book about climate change on paper <laughs> sure. okay yeah that's fair so it's nonfiction then, a, a dystopian uh, commentary on. No, I know that. Uh, no. Trust me, this one's plenty of fiction. It's it's, it's fantasy, and uh, yeah, I'm very proud of the work. And it's it's just I need to get it out there in such a way where you know, again, uh, we're under such microscopes nowadays that you you can't make a mistake, right? yeah. or a gaffe as large as that. You know, it's sure. like uh, going to a vegan you know convention wearing nothing but leather. You just can't do it. <laughs> That's very fair. That's very yeah, fair. Yeah, it's, it's fair. So you have to kind of find another way out. And to to your point, I think uh, you know going down the TikTok avenue is one of the uh, uh, the avenues I'm going to be exploring. Uh, they have a thing called Book Talk, yes. which I think oh, I yeah. will I will dive into with this with this property. So I'm quite excited about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm excited to see to to see it come out and see what it is and, and get my hands yes. on it and read it. I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll ping uh, Steve when it's, uh, when it's ready to launch. But uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, we're uh, we're excited for the new project. We have to, before we let you go, ask a question that is a little bit different for you. Uh, but normally we start all of our conversations by by asking our guests their intros to horror. Um, I know that you're not a horror fan, but I would be curious if you could, you know, recollect any early exposure that you had to the genre if there's any reason or or memory behind why you don't like it if it influenced you in a negative way or, or made you feel a certain type of way that you just didn't want to watch them anymore i'm curious if you remember any of those like first exposures to the horror genre oh uh, there was one film in particular that sort of sealed it for me and that was the exorcist ah <laughs> i'm sorry right. how old I've, were you <laughs> I, I i must have been 12 or something it just it just frightened the living daylights out of me and i couldn't <laughs> cope, cope. i therapy the whole nine yards it was just the scariest thing i've ever wow. experienced yeah yeah it's, i think the exorcist uh, is, is there's is, been a few people hands down the exorcist is the most frightening thing i've ever seen wow it, that's there are a few people yeah. that have brought that up on the show as an early one for them i know that my mom uh, the, my first time watching it, I watched it with my mom, and she was like, "You need to be prepared because of this, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it is it is an intense movie. It still holds up today, of course." Yeah, yeah, it, it was it was just it was good, the one that did it to me. Yeah, it just scared me out of my wits, and it's say, like I told ever never went back, <laughs> never want. Yeah, you know, there's enough bad news, so there's enough horror just opening the paper. I don't want to go down this road. 
But you know, again, yeah, when I got sure. involved with this whole this whole you know circus, it was like you did horror films to prove your metal, and if you did well, then they would graduate you up into other genres of filmmaking. But the horror films, they made money, and they made them mm -hmm. quickly, and you couldn't fuck them up too badly if you you know if you listen to what people said. So there you go. If you mm -hmm. could do that, so everybody when I got into the film uh, feature filmmaking. Um, Everybody that I knew was doing horror films because that's that was where how you paid your price. That was your ticket. Sure. And they were cheap. Honestly, and, you know. it's it's kind of one of the ways to still do it. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. can make them for a smaller budget. You can like a lot of indie films are horror films because you can uh -huh. experiment more and get away with more. Um, uh -huh. So it's interesting that it's like different, but different, but yet the same uh, with you know yeah. the kind of like era of filmmaking. Um, yeah, and also just to The Exorcist, it's funny, people will talk about the film that like started them, you know, the, the first horror film that they saw that either deterred them or got them into it. And sometimes you're like, I don't really get that. Like that got you into it or that put you off of it. But The Exorcist is so like cut and dry. <laughs> just it's, like it's, yeah, just, it's, just, it's just terror. It's it's disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> it it it, yes. it slaps yeah. your soul. It's just <laughs> not it doesn't it's it doesn't take prisoners i i was just i yeah. you know feeble that should have been the so log long. line yeah oh man it was just the most horrifying thing in my oh, life was the exorcist that's you know shining nothing else came close than the exorcist it was just yeah. terrifying to me that's yeah? funny wow that's a good line it was probably, and it probably was like, you know, i was probably of an age where i didn't understand that this was not exactly reality yeah. And to me, it was still very plausible. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why we asked that question. Is it, you know, it's it's interesting. I have a lot of core memories of being exposed to horror when I was a little kid, and I'm one of the you know, the I don't know the the purposes of our show. One of them is to explore that that childhood experience because sure. so, it hits harder. It hits harder when you're a oh, kid. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Especially yeah. an imaginative kid. You know. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's why so, I think I'm, I'm kind of proud of my films because they do the I you know you, we did take the edge off a little bit. We sanded down the roughness. We kind of you know yeah, there's plenty of blood and all that stuff, but it's there's always a chuckle coming soon. Yeah, just absolutely. kind of just throttle it back a little. But again, The Exorcist was just on, on a completely different level. It was just no chuckles. disturbing. No, no chuckles. No, <laughs> no chuckles from uh, no zero chuckles. <laughs> So, Steve, before we let you go, uh, we end all of these episodes by asking our guests for what we call mostly horror recommendations, which is essentially a horror film and then a non-horror film that you think our guests should check out. Um, I'm curious, as a non-horror fan, are there any horror films that you would recommend that you, you know, maybe they're or, or horror adjacent films that you uh, that you do enjoy sure. that you would recommend? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Alien. Alien yes, is one of the yes, finest forms yeah. of, you know, science fiction horror, I think, out there. Um, absolutely. What Ridley did absolutely. with Alien was just like, he fucking nailed it. Just nailed it to the wall. Yep. Yep. I saw it I saw it at a yep. drive-in, in it like, the first showing at a drive-in, it scared the shit out of me, and the sun was still halfway up, you know? And then, you didn't even <laughs> yeah. see it in a, in, a, in a great setting. And it was still just frightening and so yeah. well done. Uh, yes. As, that sounds so fun. Alien in a, a drive through as an art, as a uh, as an art director, did you f did Alien hit you more because of how like I mean the, I feel like the production design and the art design of everything in that film is just perfect. Like was that something uh -huh. that you like really appreciated seeing it for the first time? Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, I, yeah, I you know, Ridley Scott to me is God. He he is cinema God. Yeah, I amazing. don't think he, I don't think he, he, I've never thought he could do wrong. He's probably been my biggest influence has been Ridley. Mm. Um, just. Everything he does, he does immaculately. Good, bad, doesn't matter what it does. He's, there's always something interesting to watch. And at the time, at the time, Ridley was a commercial director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both he and Tony. That's that was their bread and butter. They wow. were still shooting lots of commercials at the time. Yeah, yeah. I know. You, know, you, you yeah, that's how you hone your craft. You talking sure. about David Fincher? Yeah. Like Fincher's yeah. Fincher's one of my favorite, if not my favorite director of all time. And uh, you you forget the the roots. You know what I mean? You you don't think oh, yeah. about or talk about where oh, yeah. these directors came from. So yeah. it's oh it yeah. Is good. yeah. If you can hunt down a Fincher a Fincher commercial reel, it will certainly uh, serve as inspiration 
for making a, a, a great, concise story happen in 30 seconds and do it with panache. David could always find how to do it with panache. There was one commercial he shot. was uh, It was a Coca-Cola commercial for Japan, and it was rollerbladers doing something. And it was just so well done and so tight. It's like, oh, I will never get this. I will never come close to this. Guys, Jim these. Henson. No. Jim Henson. Yeah. yeah. It's, I got to look up some you pictures. You don't mind, reels. David Fincher. <laughs> D- David Fincher worked at ILM in the rotoscope department when he was 17. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. David okay. Fincher did uh, rotoscoping. Humble. And he did this so... thing with this. Yeah, he did this thing for this girl. He shot. What was her name? Madonna. Well, they did something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hit it, hit it the out of the park game. with some music videos. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. You know, wow, that's just, crazy, just follow crazy. your guts. Yeah, follow um, your guts. So, so Alien, obviously, perfect recommendation. Uh, you have a, a larger pool with non-horror. Uh, I'm curious, just you know, a film not in the horror genre that you'd recommend our guests check out. Uh, well, yeah. From I, I've been on this Jago, you know, stuff coming out of Korea lately has just been phenomenal. I mean, Parasite Absolutely. was just sonic. In a, they yeah. are making some great, great films in Korea now. Um, uh, and, and are, they're working hard at it too. So absolutely, mm-hmm. we are always recommending. Um, you know, people people not just stick to our our Western culture box. Yeah, check out some foreign films. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of great stuff that stuff that we just don't even touch on. You know, it's completely different than what you're used to. Yes, yeah. and That's I think stuff. the interesting thing, thing about the Korean um, cinema taste is that you know uh, uh, there was there's always been this um, assumption about uh, having to have a romantic history in order to tell stories cinematically. Which has always yeah. been a little bit of the um, um, the confusion or the difficulty watching Japanese cinema sometimes is that there's an interpretation question that sometimes Westerners just don't get with Japanese cinema. Now, in in the Korean case, I think they immerse themselves so much in Western culture that they've adapted very well that Japanese sensibility, but they've been true to themselves uh, as a culture in how they tell the stories and what stories they want to tell. And I think yeah. that's the interesting part about it. They've kind of have created this wonderful bridge that it's it's extremely universal. Um, but the interesting thing I've, I've noticed about uh, Korean cinema is that there's a lot of challenges within the film with characters. There's conflict with yes. characters who, in other cultures, would be very cast oriented. Yep. Cast. Yeah. If, I hope I'm saying yeah. that correctly. Where yeah. it's like there's the, the the major, then there's the sergeant, then there's the colonel, and there's the corporal or whatever. But they are of levels that resp- that respond, you know, in certain order. But in Korean cinema, there's always feeling like you know I'm just going to tell you to go fuck yourself anyway. Yeah. This yeah. this this is freedom to be the individual in their films yeah. is really kind of cool. Yeah, I think yeah. that's. I mean to just to note some big ones like old boy is a very specific example of that. Like park, park Chan Wook's films are amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's another one, uh, like his new one decision to leave is, is phenomenal. And one of the, the fact that, uh, that wasn't nominated for best cinematography was mind blowing. But, um, there's a film called burning that was recommended to us that I haven't watched. Burn. Uh, I haven't but it's heard supposed of to be one of the best Korean films, um, of the past like decade. Yeah. Burning. Um, oh, I was and, uh, yeah. This is going to make me want to watch that as soon as we're done. So, yeah, same. yeah, I couldn't yeah. remember that. Can't say enough great things about Korean yeah. cinema. So completely. But it, I mean, but, it, but even Parasite is just like one of those movies that you have to see. Oh yeah, it's yeah. just yeah. like this yep, is unbelievable. Must. And then you find out that it's just it's not really a fictional story. Really, kind of then boggles your mind. Like there are homes like this yeah. throughout Seoul, everywhere, because yeah, that's what they lived under. That kind of threat. And it's also hey, great you because didn't like, know that Sean, I did not know that. No, <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I like how you could just tell by the the dumb <laughs> oh, yeah. look on my face. I, 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 like, I what? Like, well, I, I had no idea. What? Yeah, no, no. Those kind of <laughs> homes were built, and they lost track that there were other f- parts of the homes that weren't even there or, or, or acknowledged because they were so yeah. afraid of northern invasion. That makes sense. That it makes, makes sense. Compl- yeah, it's oh, like man. how many? You know, it's like the guy who had the bunker in the backyard. You know, the, yeah. 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 The, the next door neighbor you grew up by. Yes, yeah. it's the same thing. Yeah, it's crazy. They're all I'm over the have a bunker. <laughs> yeah, Sean, Sean's gonna have a bunker. That's a whole other conversation. Sean. He's gonna go. Yeah, don't even get me started. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, 
Steve, we uh, we really appreciate you you coming on the show and chatting with us. Again, can't say sure. enough how much we we love your films and your work in general. Um, so really appreciate this. And uh, if if anyone that's listening to this hasn't watched Thirteen Ghosts and Ghost Ship for some reason by now, um, they're classics. Do it. They are must watches. Yeah. Do it. Uh, do it as a double opinion. feature. Yeah. Do the double feature. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a great double it's a feature. Great double you, feature. You gotta do it. Get yeah. some yeah. snacks. Yeah, make it happen. Yeah, yeah. Make it yeah. happen. There you go. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure, gentlemen. Well, thank Steve, you very much. Yeah, it's it's been great. And uh, thank you again for coming on. Thank you guys so much for listening to our conversation with Steve Beck, the director of 13 Ghosts and Ghost Ship. And thanks to Steve again for being on our show. Again, if you guys haven't watched those movies, you're slacking. Um, yeah, dude. That's all I can really say. Sean and I have been a thing. seeing cool stuff recently. And yeah. when I first, you know, when we first started this podcast and we're, we're starting to get screenings for films, we're like, this is cool. We get to see movies early and it was like kind of still mm-hmm. COVID y. So we're watching screeners and then we get invited to in person screenings of films and that, those are cool too. And then Sean and I are invited to see gray house which is a horror play on broadway Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um if you've been listening to our podcast all the way through you've heard our interviews with george reinblatt and john rapson uh you know that we're theater fans um this was cool gray house is a film a film a play that originated in chicago um that was brought to Broadway. It's still in previews as we're recording this, but we were able to catch a preview of it. Um, and while we don't want to talk too much about it, because maybe we'll talk about it in the future, um, I loved it. <laughs> yeah, like, dude. I, I was about to say I we, loved it. <laughs> we uh, we literally can't say too much, but what we will say is that it's a it's a good time. It was it was incredibly interesting. The cast is awesome. You know, uh, everybody delivered, and uh, and yeah, man, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited to see it again. I'm excited mm-hmm. to talk about it, and I'm excited to uh, to really see, um, you know, just like audience reception here, yeah. and just kind of hear about how the show does because uh, it's a stellar time. So yeah, it's a, one of those keep things. You're out for that. As as a lot of theater tends to be, it was one of those things that you're talking about afterwards. Like Sean and I on our way home, you know. Yeah. I mean, good movies are like that as well, but sometimes we'll see a film and we'll just like leave it and not not really talk about it afterwards. We're like, cool, we mm-hmm. saw that. Um, but mm-hmm. I feel like we were talking about that play, obviously the whole way home and and after. Yep. And I've been thinking about it a bit too. Like, I it just has been sticking in my brain, um, yeah. which is wonderful and makes me really excited to hopefully chat more about it in the future. Um, so yeah. that's the gray house, I... as we've said. If you're in the area, check it out. Yeah, please do. I I will also say that, you know, I I'm sure that I've mentioned this before. It there's not a lot of horror theater, at least that that I'm aware of. Um mm-hmm. and it being able to experience horror in a different way, um, you know, than just, you know, reading it, watching it, playing a game. <clears throat> being it the, the more immersive, the better. It's just so fun. It was this exciting experience, you know, uh as as horror fans here all of us uh you you can kind of become desensitized and you can you can even though it's still amazing to consume this content there's this safety and this you know you're used to it at a certain point and so finding mm-hmm. a way to to experience the genre in a different way and especially in this this personal way this more intimate way uh, yeah. is is just super exciting and i i seeing this show has me excited like like i'm like that can work that can totally work and, 100% and I just want to see more. Just give me more and more and more and more, more. Yes. So. Yeah, I agree. If you if you haven't been exposed to a lot of theater in your life, but you like horror films and you're like, I wish this was more immersive. Theater is a, is as immersive as you can get for the most part. So definitely can't recommend it enough. Um, it is it is a dying art form, unfortunately, uh, that yeah. hopefully doesn't die. Um, yeah. That said, it's time. You've all been waiting I'm sure by this point for this week's mostly horror seats. 
<laughs> for this week's mostly horror recommendations from Sean and I. I feel like I went first last time, so Sean, you got to go first this time. All right, I have two. I have two. Um, also, I don't. I don't know if you've picked up on this. With this, because we talk about horror so much, uh, I honestly am kind of looking for the other things that I'm stoked. These are on. just recommendations. Um, yeah, these are not. Yeah, even, these are just. Right. I mean, it's, you know, really keep. Yeah, it's. I so the first one is one that I'm sure that I've talked about this movie, uh, which I tend to do a lot, is just kind of re-hitting home things that I think I've I've brought up in the past. But the first one, I think, is a, in alignment a little bit with our episode. We talk with Steve a bit about you know, horror that takes place, horror scenes and movies and things that take place in movies that are not really horror. And one that always comes to my mind as something that just scared the shit out of me is, uh, is a, um, a moment in hook, uh, which is a movie mm. that I love. So I'm going to re recommend that everybody check out hook. Uh, I'm talking about the, the boo box. Um, it's, it is a short scene in the movie. It is a, a trunk that hook puts, pirates in uh when they are bad when they are naughty and they uh they do some things to people in them i'll i'm not going to spoil it for you if you don't remember but yeah i'm, I'm going to go ahead and recommend hook and the other thing that i want to recommend is and you probably have to help me out with it actually is dude the japanese house song that you showed me earlier <laughs> was so good it was so good and it you re reminded me how much i liked the japanese oh, house um so good i, I love love, the japanese house. <laughs> love their new single uh whatever it's called something baby that came sunshine to my mind a baby. second ago yeah sunshine baby dude a fucking jam so yeah. everybody should listen to that song so i guess i'll just add the japanese house if you yeah. have never listened to them uh, Sugar Pill is one of my favorite songs of all time. Probably my second favorite song of all time. Um, one of uh, one of the Japanese house's like earliest singles. Um, their new album is called In the End It Always Does. And it comes out on June 30th. So I am ecstatic. Yeah. Um, and the Sunshine Baby that they just released is uh, the third single of this album <gasps> that they've put out. It's a bomb. Um, it's very good. Um, it's a bop. Yeah, I don't know what else to say besides it's very good. The Japanese house is amazing. So, what about you, Steve? What are your recs? Um, all right. I just have one. I feel like mm -hmm. I I don't think I've talked about it. I don't think so. I hope I what haven't. Is it? I don't know. I Let's feel I'm it. I'm now like feeling like I've talked about it, and now hey man, we really if you're hitting need it to home record. twice. We need to record well, what we. Yes, what we it's hard, dude. It is hard. Uh, um, but what do you got? I'm recommending the new Gendy Tartakovsky series, Unicorn Warriors Eternal. I think I talked I about this in a. You probably already know this segment, but I don't think I yes. recommended it. All right, thank yeah. Christ. Um, <laughs> this, this is confirmation that Steve fucks with it. <laughs> Gendy Tartakovsky is uh, a part of our lives. He created Dexter's... A, he went to the same college that I dropped out from. So I got to throw that out there. Whoop, whoop. Uh, Represent. Shout out to Columbia College of <laughs> Chicago. He created Dexter's Lab. Um, he yeah, created Samurai Jack. Boom, uh, did he get he back did... to the back Samurai Jack? Put your, put your top back. <laughs> he did primal uh which i admit i have not seen all of but i have enjoyed everything that i've seen of it i love yeah i love um, what i've seen he was you know a writer on powerpuff girls um he's been he's touched so many things yeah. and he he directed the hotel transylvania films which again i oh, really watched i didn't know that he did all three of them okay all three no of them. shit um, okay so yeah all three hotel transylvania right. films um, but his new project, which is released on Adult Swim and then HBO, um, it may just be called Max by the time that we're talking, but um, yeah. it's called, again, Unicorn Warriors Eternal. And uh, the series follows a team of ancient heroes protecting the world from an ominous force. Throughout history, unicorns have symbolized the virtuous appearing to ensure that goodness reigns when the rear who, when the reawakening of our heroes comes too early, they find themselves mm -hmm. in the bodies of teenagers. Um, 
And yeah, the boom, boom, boom. As with Samurai Jack and even Dexter's Lab, but but more so Samurai Jack, that's a little bit more adult, I would say. It just taught it like hits so many things. Like it seems like Gendy is the type of person to be like, I mean, very much so. Like, I want to write about pirates and automatons and also a god and also an elephant and then just put it all together and you're like this is fucking brilliant like the it's so good he's able to with samurai jack specifically and also this show like he is a show not tell guy um yeah and he is like to me the epitome of like what animation is you know what i mean like sure. it is yeah the fucking like it, it 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 does what other things can't and and this show specifically unicorn warriors eternal is like something you could i'm just gonna say objectively you could never make this in another format i don't believe fair it's it could maybe exist as a comic but but not as effectively i i, 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 I guess i mean um, i guess i mean visual uh, like fi- you couldn't make this into a film, you know what I mean? Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, okay, yeah, um, yeah, dude, it's I, I'm not as far, I'm not caught up. I think you're caught up. I'm not. There's not a ton up. of I've episodes yet, but yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen them all. Um, but I am digging the absolute hell out of it. Also, dude, something every time a person says Samurai Jack, I feel the music like the vibration of that music in my spine dude chelsea can you give us a a a... future (laughs) that is ah cool chelsea hit us with a bound to the yet i was gonna say you don't have to do a lot but yeah give us give us a little bit of theme song we got the theme song going we're grooving you're grooving with us if you're listening Uh, yeah everyone's head is bobbing right i feel (laughs) in unison yeah (laughs) but but yeah dude uh no, I, I I loved what you said, and it's a great great recommendation, Steve. Yeah, I uh, also I guess we'll just while we're here watch Samurai mm. Jack. Uh, yeah, over dude. when I first moved to New York, I was like, I'm gonna hunker down and watch every episode, and it is just yeah unfathomably good. Like the stories are yeah. so good and so like I don't know. You watch a show about a samurai. And you get a show about, like, I don't know, something weird. A shape shifting like, master of darkness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you, you get, you get all these like themes and characters that you would have never expected from a show called Samurai Jack, and it's just done so well. So, can I just say that. that you were watching an interview? Um, you were yeah. watching an interview, and he <laughs> he was talking about which uh which episode might be his favorite and mm-hmm. straight up dude he brought up the the blind, blind archman and it yeah. is just the objectively uh, this isn't to put any other episodes down but it's just the coolest episode one of yeah. the coolest animated anythings i've ever seen uh chelsea let's get one more watch out <laughs> <laughs> bound to the yet <laughs> Oh, we're, gonna play, back. we're gonna play just enough samurai jack music to get this like copyright infringement yeah. <laughs> on here, which is awful. Um so those are my recommendations. Gendy Tartakovsky, I listen, it's no secret. I'm trying to get him on our show. I need him on our show. I can't figure out a way. If anyone's listening is connected to Gendy, hit us up. Uh yeah. As always, thank you guys so much for listening. Um email us mostly horror movie night at gmail.com what should you email us email us about 13 ghosts and ghost ship uh in the spirit of steve beck email us about your favorite commercials there's some good commercials out there Um, dude email us about your favorite commercials that's a cool we will read them on the show i've had many a conversation about a great commercial fucking talk to us man talk to us speak Uh, words write words it's not just email you can do it on instagram we're there at mostly horror pod we're also on the tweeter at mostly horror yep. we're also on tiktok at mostly horror it's all kind of the same content but in various mm-hmm. different ways that you can watch it um at yeah. your convenience you can follow me on everything at steven is average and sean is on all the socials at hypocrite inc or hypocrite dot inc and that is all that we got for you this week great interviews coming down the pipeline so keep listening And we'll catch you on the flippity flip. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye.